What's going on, guys? Your boy Terry by Reacts here, back with another reaction, and we are doing theory videos today. The long ones, the short ones, whatever. It's all theories today. No tributes, okay? So we got what do the White Walkers want? Okay, what do the White Walkers want? That's what we're doing right now. So let's just jump into it. I've always been curious about what's their motive here because they seems like they just want to destroy the world, but there must be something deeper that goes along with this. And I know it's not really showcased in the show. We really don't know what they want. Like, do they want world dominion? What are they going to do when they kill everybody? You know what I'm saying? Do they, was there an agreement? The agreement was broken. You know, what happened? You know, wh why we want to take over these Westeros streets, man? Let's go. Why? Oh, my sweet summer child, what do you know about fear? Fear is for the winter. When the you know, I've always wondered why people keep calling us that sweet summer child. I've always wondered, but I never asked why. And now I hear this and I'm like, oh, okay. That's where they get this thing from. It's like it's it's like um it's like somebody saying to you, "You know nothing." Terabyte reacts. <laughs> that's pretty much that's pretty much what that saying means. When people say stuff like that to you or call you a certain thing, it's like uh, and what this saying means is basically it's like, "Oh my sweet summer child," is like you don't know what winter is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Snows fall a hundred feet deep. Fear is for the long night, when the sun hides for years, and children are born and live and die, all in darkness. That is the time for fear, my little lord, when the white walkers move through the woods. Thousands of years ago, there came a night that lasted a generation. Kings froze to death in their castles, same as the shepherds in their huts. And women smothered their babies rather than see them starve, and wept, and felt the tears freeze on their cheeks. So is this the sort of story that you like? Why, why the heck is this thing doing that? Why is it doing that? In that darkness, the White Walkers came for the first time. They swept through cities and kingdoms, riding their dead horses, hunting with their packs of pale spiders, big as hounds. What are you telling him now? Only what the Little Lord wants to hear. <laughs> Little is known about the White Walkers, where they come from, what they want, and why they hate humanity. What we do know is that they murder innocent people, resurrect those people from the dead, reproduce by transforming innocent babies into White Walkers, and have amassed an enormous army of undead wildlings and former men of the Night's Watch. Basically, the people of Westeros are fucked. The White Walkers possess many magical powers. The scope of their magical abilities is unknown, but they have shown the ability to manipulate ice and cold weather. Whenever they approach, a cold storm follows. They wield spears made out of ice that shatter the steel of any sword they come in contact with. They also possess super strength and can effortlessly throw a grown man several feet. But their most famous ability is resurrection. White Walkers can raise people from the dead and then add them to their ranks. These resurrected dead are called Whites, who have no control of their actions and act as foot soldiers in the army of the dead. Now, the White Walkers do have some weaknesses. They can be killed by swords made out of Valyrian steel, and even Dragonglass is shown to be deadly when used against them. Both Valyrian steel and Dragonglass are in short supply, since they were ori originally made with the help of Dragonfire. George R. R. Martin has described the White Walkers as beautiful, inhuman, elegant, and dangerous, suggesting there is a humanity to them. They are shown to possess a form of language that is described in the books as ice crackling. They have a humanoid appearance and are described as flesh and bones, with ice running through their veins. It is likely that they have some sort of civilization far north in the land of Always Winter. In Season 4, Episode 4, Oathkeeper, a White Walker is shown carrying Craster's last son north of the Wall to an ice palace. This 
This ice palace could act as a place of worship or sort of a home base for the White Walkers. This episode also marks the first appearance of the Night King, the apparent leader of the White Walkers. The Night King has been described by showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Wise as a force of destruction, the personification of death coming for everyone in the story. On the outside, the White Walkers are truly horrifying. They appear to be brutally vicious ice demons who murder and then resurrect everyone in their path. As we move towards the grand finale of Game of Thrones, many people believe that the North and South will unite in the fight against the White Walkers and save Westeros. Jon will lead the attack, given his experience with the Night's Watch, and with the help of Daenerys and her dragons, the White Walkers will be defeated once and for all. It's a great storybook ending. Our heroes unite and defeat the enemy. But what if it's not that black and white? Game of Thrones is a show that has subverted the major cliches of most fantasy epics. George R.R. R. Martin was heavily influenced by J.R.R. R. Tolkien, but he's been critical of authors who imitate the good versus evil themes found in the Lord of the Rings series, the climactic battle where good triumphs over evil. He describes the wars in his books as morally complex, which is clearly obvious. I still don't know who I was rooting for during the battle at the Blackwater. Quoting one of his famous authors, William Faulkner, Martin believes that the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. We've seen this personified in characters like Jaime Lannister, Daenerys Targaryen, and even Arya Stark. How many times have you heard someone say, ah, oh, I used to hate Jaime in season one, but now he's my favorite character? Go on any Game of Thrones subreddit or comment section, and you'll find fans debating whether Daenerys is a righteous queen or an authoritarian nutjob like her father, the Mad King. For real. Most characters in Game of Thrones fall in between the moral spectrum of good versus evil. Why would the White Walkers be any different? I mean, how do you think this is going to end? A classic tale of good versus evil? The good guys team up, the living triumph over the dead, Danny, John, and Tyrion ride the dragons with the help of a Bran, Arya, Sansa, Brienne, and the Hound super team, they defeat the White Walkers, kill the Night's King, take the Iron Throne, and live happily ever after? If you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. In this video, I propose the idea that the White Walkers aren't just mindless, killing ice demons hell-bent on Westerosi genocide, but living, breathing, intelligent creatures that wage war for a purpose. Whether it be revenge, betrayal, survival, or conquest, the White Walkers fight for something. The question is what? I don't think this is going to be the classic tale of good versus evil, the living versus the dead. I think there's a side to this story we haven't heard yet, and in order to know what the White Walkers want, we must see this story from their perspective. Which is almost impossible since we know so little about them, but we can look to the past for answers. 12,000 years before Robert's Rebellion, the continent of Westeros was occupied by two groups, the First Men and the Children of the Forest. For thousands of years, the First Men and the Children fought for control of the Western continent. After fighting to a standstill, they eventually came to an agreement called the Pact which was signed on the Isle of Faces. The pact stated that the First Men would have domains to all open lands, fields, shores, and mountains, while the forests would be the domain of the children. For 4,000 years, the two races coexisted in peace, with the First Men converting to the religion of the children, worshipping the old gods of the forest. About a couple hundred years after the pact was signed, the First Men and the Children of the Forest came under attack from the White Walkers for the first time, a race of ice demons from the far north of Westeros. It is unknown why the White Walkers attacked the first time, and nobody truly knows how they were defeated. According to myth, the White Walkers were defeated by a last hero of the First Men. When the Long Night fell upon Westeros for the first time and the White Walkers invaded, the last hero and his companions went in search of the Children of the Forest, with the belief that the children's magic could help destroy the White Walkers. The last hero was the only survivor, and after fending off attacks from giants, whites, and the Walkers, he finally reached the Children of the Forest and gained their help. The Night's Watch was formed and the Walkers were defeated in what became known as the Battle for the Dawn. The war was over, the Walkers retreated to the far north of Westeros, and the Wall was built. Legend has it that with the help of the Children of the Forest, Bran the Builder, the founder of House Stark, built the Wall to protect Westeros should the Walkers ever return. The Wall is described as 300 miles long and approximately 700 feet high, and according to legend, the Wall has old spells woven into it that keep the Walkers from passing it. 
But in reality, it probably wasn't made by man. They say that the wall was constructed by carving giant blocks of ice out of the frozen lakes in the haunted forest. They used sledges to transport the ice blocks and stack them one on top of another. Even with the help of giants and the children of the forest, the wall would have taken hundreds, possibly thousands of years to build. And according to legend, the wall was built shortly after the Battle for the Dawn. Now, wouldn't it make more sense if the White Walkers built the wall since they... You know, they kind of control ice. I mean, the children of the forest are children of the forest. They possess magic, but that magic is related to the earth and the weirwood trees. Their magic doesn't allow them to manipulate ice. The wall is a massive structure and would have taken thousands of years for men to build it on their own. But then that begs the question, why would the White Walkers build a wall to protect men from themselves? It's a little bit contradictory. Well, what if the wall was part of some sort of agreement that dictates territory? We know that the first men in the Children of the Forest signed a peace treaty that dictated lands between the two people. Well, what if the first men in the White Walkers did the same? The story of the last hero that defeated the Walkers says that he was surrounded by enemies before he reached the Children of the Forest, and with the help of the children, they halted the White Walker invasion. But they didn't destroy them. The White Walkers continued to live on after the Battle of the Dawn, evidenced by their return. So if the last hero found a way to halt their invasion, why not destroy them altogether? What if the first men and the walkers came to an agreement, similar to the first men and the children thousands of years ago, with the wall acting as a designation of land rather than a form of protection? The first men would continue to control the lands south of the wall, and the white walkers would be entitled to all the lands north of the wall, since, you know, they do well in the cold. Now, I know what you're saying. It seems impossible that men and white walkers can come to an agreement. How would this even come to fruition? Well, in comes the Night's King. Not to be mistaken for the Night King, the Night's King is the story of the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. After the construction of the wall, the Night's Watch was formed. The Night's Watch was once made up of great warriors and knights who would defend the wall should the White Walkers ever return. According to legend, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch fell in love with the White Walker and named her his bride. He named himself the Night's King and together they ruled over the wall for 13 years, enslaving the men of the Night's Watch and performing human sacrifices. He was eventually defeated by Joramin, the king beyond the wall, and Brandon the Breaker, the king of the north. Now, some people believe that the Night's King wasn't just the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, but he was a Stark, and that his marriage to a female White Walker was part of the pact between the First Men and the White Walkers. In order to keep the peace between these two worlds, a marriage could have been arranged between a Stark and a White Walker, in this case, the Night's King and his bride. A marriage between two noble houses is a very popular tradition in Westeros. It's used to build alliances and keep peace between two great houses. In Season 1, Robert Baratheon and Ned Stark agreed to join their houses by marrying their son and daughter, Joffrey and Sansa, and believed that their marriage would keep the peace between the North and the South. That obviously didn't work out, and neither did the marriage between the Night's King and his bride. He was disposed of, and the Night's Watch destroyed all known records of his 13-year rule. People have also speculated that the Night's King wasn't the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, but he was the first and only Night's King. Together, he and his bride ruled over the demilitarized zone that lies between Westeros and north of the Wall, the Wall itself. They ended up taking the Night Fort as their seat. The Night Fort is a point of interest because it is the oldest castle on the Wall, it was built shortly after the wall's construction. In the current day, the Night Fort is no longer manned due to the dwindling numbers of the Night's Watch, but some believe that it holds a great secret of the Night Watch's history. Now, according to the myth, the Night's King and his bride were making human sacrifices at the Night Fort, most likely to the White Walkers. We learn in Season 3 that the Night Fort has a secret passageway that leads under the wall, so it makes sense that they would choose the Night Fort as their seat. It's easy access beyond the wall. The only character that we know for certain makes sacrifices to the White Walkers is Craster. He sacrifices his infant sons, and the White Walkers leave him in peace. What if the human sacrifices by the Night's King and his bride were part of the pact between the First Men and the White Walkers? From what we know, it looks like the White Walkers can only reproduce by turning infant babies into White Walkers themselves. George R.R. R. Martin has referred to them in the past as unborn but always living. It is proven by Craster that if you offer them sacrifices, they will spare your life. Of course, this probably didn't sit well with the original men of the Night's Watch. 
From the perspective of the Knight's King, he was only trying to keep the peace between two enemies that had fought viciously against each other for years. From the perspective of the Knight's Watch, forming a peace with these super-powered magical beings could one day lead to them returning and conquering Westeros. The Knight's King was trying to keep a peace between these two warring worlds, but he was killed all the same. Remind you of someone? The watch. So in essence, the pact between the First Men and the White Walkers would contain three main clauses. No men are allowed north of the Wall, and no White Walkers are allowed south of the Wall. A Stark will wed a White Walker in order to keep the peace, and the occasional human sacrifice will be made to ensure the survival of the White Walkers as a species. 8,000 years after the first long night, the treaty has been broken. Hundreds of thousands of men are living north of the Wall. The human sacrifices to the White Walkers have ended, except for Craster and his babies, and the Starks no longer rule Winterfell. Not only do the White Walkers feel betrayed by man, but also threatened. The one thing that is a threat to their existence has returned to the world. From the very moment those dragons came into the world, we as fans have expected a deadly confrontation between the worlds of ice and fire. This is where Jon Snow comes in. The White Walker sightings began sometime near the end of Robert's Rebellion, which also coincides with the birth of Daenerys Targaryen, Robb Stark, and Jon Snow. Now in the books, all the Stark children are wargs, so for the sake of the show, we'll replace Robb with Bran. The birth of these three characters also coincides with the rebirth of magic. There hadn't been dragons for hundreds of years. Wait a minute, we, we gonna back that up a bit? He just said that all the Stark kids are wargs in the book. Robert's Rebellion, which also coincides with the birth of Daenerys Targaryen, Robb Stark, and Jon Snow. Now, in the books, all the Stark children are wargs, so for the sake of the show, we'll replace Rob with Bran. The birth of these three characters also coincides with the rebirth of magic. There hadn't been dragons for hundreds of years until Daenerys. There hadn't been a Stark warg for thousands of years until Bran. And Jon, well, Jon is a combination of both. Daenerys' fire magic has been on display since Season 1. She is immune to fire, evident by the birth of her three dragons in Season 1, and when she murders the cows in Bay Dothrak by setting their temple ablaze in Season 6. In the books, the Targaryens are described as having silver hair and purple eyes, traits that are not found in normal human beings. They have a special relationship with fire magic through their Valerian ancestry, and they also have a special relationship with dragons, with some people believing that Targaryens have dragon blood. Similar to the Targaryens, the Starks also have a connection to magic in the Earth through their ancestry that goes back to the First Men, and a possible magical connection to the Far North and the White Walkers. If the infamous Night's King was a Stark and his wife a White Walker, their children would be half Stark and half White Walker. This relationship between a male Stark and a female White Walker could explain why the Starks have such an affinity for cold weather and why they tend to be wargs and greenseers. In the books, all the Stark children are wargs. They each have a special connection with their respective direwolves, and they have shown the ability to warg into their direwolves knowingly or unknowingly. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Starks are related to the White Walkers and that the Targaryens are related to dragons, that they possess dragon blood, but there is something fishy going on in Westeros in regards to magic. And this is why Jon Snow is the perfect candidate to bring the worlds of ice and fire together in peace. For an entire season, and in the case of the novels, an entire book, Jon Snow acts as a negotiator between the Night's Watch and the Wildlings. Mance Raider tells Jon that he united the Wildlings because he didn't want to see his people wiped out during the Long Night. But the Night's Watch can only see them as Wildling invaders, enemies. Jon Snow acts as a mediator between the two groups. He tries to convince the Night's Watch that if the Wildlings are left beyond the Wall, they will be slaughtered and added to the army of the dead. On the other hand, he must convince the Wildlings that the Night's Watch can be trusted and won't slaughter them in their sleep. He succeeds for the most part until he's killed. What if Jon plays the same role during the Long Night, acting as the bridge between the White Walkers and the people of Westeros, uniting both sides to fight against the true enemy of both, Daenerys Targaryen, the Mother of Dragons? Game of Thrones is a story of ice and fire, two worlds on a collision course that can end the world as we know it. 
and those two worlds of ice and fire run through the veins of Jon Snow. Through his Stark ancestry, Jon is connected to Northern magic and the White Walkers. He possesses the ice magic of the First Men. And through his Targaryen ancestry, Jon is connected to Old Valyria and their dragons. He has the fire magic of Old Valyria. He is the perfect candidate to bring peace to both worlds. Is it coincidence that his father Rhaegar Targaryen, a man obsessed with prophecy, had a child with a Stark woman? Rhaegar believed his third son would be the prince that was promised, and by birthing a child with Lyanna Stark, Rhaegar gave life to the living, breathing Song of Ice and Fire, and quite possibly the only chance of uniting both worlds and bringing peace to Westeros. So in conclusion, I don't think the Night King is a Dark Lord whose only ambition is absolute destruction. George R.R. R. Martin just doesn't create one-dimensional villains like that, unless that villain is Joffrey or Ramsay, but you know, they're awesome. I see the Night King as a scarier, more powerful, and less forgiving version of Mance Raider. A king who wants to see his people live, a king who wants to see his people survive. An ancient White Walker who believes that men can no longer be trusted. George R.R. Martin has stated several times that the ending to Game of Thrones will be bittersweet. How bittersweet would it be if Jon Snow must save the world by killing Daenerys Targaryen? Thank you for watching this video, guys. This is a theory that's been floating around the internet for years, so I put some of the references I used in the description below. Um, some that agree with the theory, some that outline it pretty well, and some that vehemently disagree. So, it's all very interesting. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, and most importantly, make sure you yell at me in the comments below. Thank you. Oh my god, that was an awesome theory. I <clears throat> hope you guys don't mind. There's a little bit of construction going on at my house at the moment. They're working on the roof, so that's why you probably throw out sometimes. I'm muting my mic ever so often when, when I'm just listening. I'm muting my mic so you guys won't hear the, the boom but sometimes I do click it on and you might hear some boom boom in the background or some heavy lifting because they're literally, they're literally like right over my head while I'm recording but I'm trying to get these theory videos out today as much as possible so that you guys can have a lot um, to watch I'm planning to put out some some current stuff also um, so look out for those but anyways, man, this theory was great to see that. And and it's true that um I'm not to I'm not expecting a storybook ending to Game of Thrones. I'm just not. I'm not expecting it. It just doesn't seem like something that George R. R. Martin would authorize. He's still going to be a EP on on um on season eight. He is a voice. He still has a voice on the show, um, regardless of what you guys may think of, you know, how they're wrapping up the season. I really don't think it's going to be a storybook predictive ending. I really do believe that something strange is going to happen that we don't want to happen. And that's, you know, and that's going to have us talking and talking until we get the, 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 um, the books the completion of the books um, from George himself. So I'm expecting something great, something grander to come for season eight, but also a very bittersweet ending, something that we don't want, that we don't expect. Um, I, I just don't want them to wrap it up with, with, you know, with a bow on it. You know what I'm saying? I want this to have us talking for the next you know, two to three years, maybe even five years after the season ends. You know what I'm saying? Us reading the book, comparing it to the show, how the show ended and stuff. You see, you're still hearing that stuff. I'm sorry about that, guys, but I'm pretty sure you can hear me pretty clearly. I will listen to the audio and make sure that it's good for y'all. Okay, so thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. This is your first time. We do Game of Thrones theories over here. We do other stuff. Check out the other series on the channel, of course. Thank you guys for watching. I uh, um leave a like on the video, leave a comment in the comment section. I'm still trying to get over this cold. The last part of it is still like sitting on my chest and stuff. So I'm having a little bit of hard time, you know, breathing and you know, I'm coughing just a little bit. But it's okay, you know, it's okay, you know, I'm here for you guys, and hopefully you can show up for me, okay? So, 
Thank you guys for watching. You already know who it is. It's your boy Therabyte Reacts. And peace.